Operation Desert Storm is a victory for the United States and its fellow coalition members. President George H.W. Bush, however, does not face another victory in the elections and loses to the charismatic Arkansas politician Bill Clinton in 1992. As the Clinton government finds its footing, the United States Special Forces are about to face off against a new breed of terrorist, one that will continue to change into the 21st century and bring forth unprecedented acts of terrorism against the USA and its allies. The rules of war are rewritten through the changing political and world landscape of the 21st century. The United States Special Forces continue their show of adaptability throughout and maintain their adherence to their five truths. Truth one, humans are more important than hardware. People, not equipment, make the critical difference. The right people, highly trained and working as a team, will accomplish the mission with the equipment available. On the other hand, the best equipment in the world cannot compensate for a lack of the right people. Truth two, quality is better than quantity. A small number of people, carefully selected, well-trained and well-led, are preferable to larger numbers of troops, some of whom may not be up to the task. Truth three, special operations forces cannot be mass produced. It takes years to train operational units to the level of proficiency needed to accomplish difficult and specialized SOF missions. Intense training, both in SOF schools and units, is required to integrate competent individuals into fully capable units. This process cannot be hastened without degrading ultimate capability. Truth four, competent special operations forces cannot be created after emergencies occur. Creation of competent, fully mission capable units takes time. Employment of fully capable special operations capability on short notice requires trained and constantly available SOF units in peacetime. Truth five, most special operations require non-SOF assistance. The operational effectiveness of our deployed forces cannot be and never has been achieved without being enabled by our joint service partners. The support of Air Force, Army, Marine and Navy engineers, technicians, intelligence analysts, and the numerous other professions that contribute to SOF have substantially increased our capabilities and effectiveness throughout the world. In December 1992, President Bush brings the U.S. military hand-in-hand hand with the United Nations for Operation Restore Hope. Their goal is to bring order and aid to the war-torn country of Somalia, racked by civil war and ever-splintering factions. Humanitarian acts, as the Unified Task Force, or UNITAF, learns, are made near impossible in a war zone. On December 3rd, the UN passes Resolution 794, which authorizes the use of all necessary means to establish as soon as possible a secure environment for humanitarian relief operations in Somalia. Leading amongst these factions are those under the command of Mohamed Farah Aidid, the self-proclaimed president of Somalia and his Somali National Alliance. Aidid will prove UNITAF's greatest enemy. On August 8, 1993, his militia bombs a U.S. vehicle. Four MPs are killed. Seven more MPs are killed later in the month. President Bill Clinton, months into his term, finds himself challenged by Aidid. A special task force made up of 400 Delta Force operatives and Army Rangers is born. Its name is Task Force Ranger. Their mission, hunt down Mohammed Farah Aidid. Major General William F. Garrison deploys with his team to Somalia on August 22nd. They make their headquarters in a hangar in Mogadishu, Somalia's capital city. The conditions are not favorable as the site is in disrepair and lacks clean water. Task Force Ranger stages raids to confiscate arms and arrest sympathizers of the warlord and familiarize themselves with the streets of war-torn Mogadishu. Their capture of Osman Aliatu, chief financier for Aidid, on September 21st is a prologue of things to come. 
a U.S. Black Hawk helicopter is shot down four days later by a rocket-propelled grenade. Three crew members are killed. For the SNA, it is a small victory against U.S. forces. The UH-60 Black Hawk helicopter is manufactured by Sikorsky and has been a reliable transport for the U.S. Army since 1979. Both a lift and assault craft, the Black Hawk is propelled by twin rotors and manned by a four-man crew. It carries 11 combat troops and is used for everything from recon to medevac to air assault. Task Force Ranger will see its metal tested in what starts as a one-hour operation but will go down as Day of the Rangers. At 1350 hours, Task Force Ranger receives intelligence on the location of IDEED's top political advisor, Mohammed Hassan Awali, and Foreign Minister Omar Salad Elmi. Their plan is promptly made. Two MH6 Little Bird helicopters will deploy Delta operatives to attack the building. Four Rangers will rappel down the building's side from hovering Black Hawk helicopters and secure a corner each. Nine Hummers and three M939 trucks will arrive to pick up the assault team and prisoners. The Little Birds face a dust storm created by their rotors when they arrive at 1542 hours. One of the Little Birds is forced to land away from its position. The Black Hawks face their own problems, as Black Hawk, called Super 67, accidentally lands a block north from the intended target. Ranger Private First Class Todd Blackburn is injured while fast roping down and needed to be evacuated by the Humvees. Sergeant Dominic Pilla, riding in a Humvee, is shot in the head and killed by Somali militants hiding amongst the streets. At 1620 hours, a rocket-propelled grenade finds its mark with one of the Blackhawks, Super 61. Sergeant Jim Smith and Sergeant Daniel Bush do their best to defend the crash site from Somali militants. The men are rescued by a little bird. Bush will later succumb to having been shot four times. The fallen Black Hawk is investigated by a combat search and rescue team, despite an RPG hit to their helicopter. They find pilots Cliff, Elvis Walcott, and Donovan Briley are dead from the RPG hit while two crew chiefs are severely injured. Kevlar plates from the fallen helicopter formed a makeshift shelter. The ground assault forces, meanwhile, are the victims of their own miscommunication. One keeps expecting the other to make the call for support. The RPG downs another Black Hawk helicopter, Super 64, piloted by Chief Warrant Officer 3, Michael Durant. It is 1640 hours. Roger, he The assault team convenes on the first crash site to rescue survivors and meet heavy fire by the Somalis. They are forced to take over several nearby houses with their wounded for shelter. They will be there all night. Seeing the wreckage of Durant's Black Hawk, Delta snipers Master Sergeant Gary Gordon and Sergeant First Class Randy Sugart are inserted to rescue Durant and his crew from a mob of Somalis heading towards the wreck. Their aim even in the chaos, is true, and several of the mob are wounded. Their helicopter, however, is hit by an RPG and forced to withdraw. Shugart is killed by the mob, leaving Gordon to arm Durant with the fallen soldier's Car 15 rifle. Ten more minutes later, the crowd kills Gordon. The crew of the fallen Black Hawk are killed by the mob, and Durant himself is beaten. The arrival of Aidid's militia save him from death, but to live as a prisoner of the warlord. While the American positions face an angry crowd of Somalis, 
they are kept in check by Little Bird gunships, operated by the Night Stalkers. The violence continues throughout the night. Malaysian and Pakistani forces accompany a relief convoy. With no contingency planning done in advance, they will face further hurdles in rescuing the fallen soldiers. The convoy is awesome. General Garrison dispatches them at once. Four Pakistani tanks, American M939 flatbed trucks and Humvees, and the Malaysian Gondor APC armored personnel carriers. They are given air support by Cobra Assault and Black Hawk helicopters. Four and a half hours later, the Battle of Mogadishu is over, but the violence isn't. The rescue convoy is out of room for all of the forces, leaving a group of Delta operators and rangers to walk the very long mile to their rendezvous. This Mogadishu mile is the final gauntlet for the soldiers as they face danger hidden in alleys and rooftops. One operative is shot in the back, Sergeant Randall J. Ramaglia, and killed by the assassin's bullet. The Battle of Mogadishu, originally intended as a quick mission, was a bloodbath. 18 U.S. soldiers are killed while 73 are wounded. The Somalis, combined from militia and civilians, numbered between 315 to 2,000 casualties. The American dead are not so lucky as their corpses are dragged through the streets by Somalis. One soldier's body is even beheaded. CW3 Durant is held prisoner for 11 days by the SNA. His nose, eye socket, and cheekbone broken from the crowd. While prisoner, Durant is shot in the leg and tied up with a dog chain in an empty concrete room. He holds on to life, even endearing himself to his captors. Eleven days later, he is released into U.S. custody. In the aftermath of the Battle of Mogadishu, President Bill Clinton awards the Medal of Honor posthumously to two of the fallen Americans, Master Sergeant Gary I. Gordon and Sergeant First Class Randall D. Sugart. Gary Gordon and Randall Sugart died in the most courageous and selfless way any human being can act. They risked their lives without hesitation. They gave their lives to save others. Their actions were clearly above and beyond the call of duty. Today, on behalf of the United States Congress, I award them both the Medal of Honor. They join a role of heroes that include soldiers like Sergeant York, Audie Murphy, Jimmy Doolittle, Teddy Roosevelt Jr., Senator Kerry, and only some 3,000 others across more than two centuries of our nation's history. We will remember Sergeants Gordon and Shugart not only as heroes who fell in battle, but as good men who loved their families. They are the first Medals of Honor since Vietnam. There is more to the Battle of Mogadishu than Idid's faction and violent Somalis, as the United States will learn. The unruly mob was armed and trained by a man soon to become the enemy of not only the U.S., but also the world, Osama bin Laden. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.